Hello, I'm David Hines. Welcome to another edition of Hindsight. Today we deal with the suspension of the parliament in Guyana. The president of Guyana, in his sole deliberate judgment, has suspended Guyana's parliament. He was avoiding a no-confidence motion brought by one of the parliamentary parties. Guyanese leaders seem stunned. The rest of the Caribbean establishment are unperturbed, or so it seems. After all, the president has acted constitutionally. But that constitutional act has far-reaching implications for Guyana. The next few months would be more than interesting. Let me give you a background to the situation. Guyana's political system differs from the rest of the Anglophone Caribbean. The offices of the head of state and head of government are fused in the presidency. The president is elected separately from the parliament. The president could also be elected with a plurality of the popular vote rather than the customary majority. So unlike other Caribbean countries, divided government is possible in Guyana. This is exactly what happened as a result of the last election held in 2011. The party that is in control of the executive branch, the East Indian dominated PPP, does not control a majority in the legislature. The two other parliamentary parties, the Alliance for Change, supported by the dissident East Indian voters, and the African dominated a Partnership for National Unity coalition, together have a one seat majority in the parliament. In effect, the executive government is a minority government. After the Minister of Finance admitted to spending funds that were not authorized by the parliament, the AFC moved a motion of no confidence against the government just before the last parliamentary recess. Once the two parties that make up the majority voted together, as they said they would, the parliament, sorry, the government was sure to fall. The government indicated that it was ready to face the consequences of the vote, but it used its authority to delay the resumption of parliament. When that ploy failed, it indicated it would either dissolve or prorogue, that is, suspend the parliament. The former would mean new elections, while the latter would mean unfettered rule by the executive branch, the president and his cabinet. On Monday, November 10, President Donald Ramatar chose the latter. If Guyanese in the world had any doubt about the dictatorial orientation and the nature of the current PPP regime, I hope the president's use of the heavy hammer to pound all Guyanese would erase such doubts. Today, Guyanese rightly mourn another death blow to their right to be free people in a free Guyana. But let's be real, we look for that. The parliamentary majority parties must bear equal responsibility for where we have arrived. Politics is also about engagement at multiple levels. If you accept that your only engagement would be traditional parliamentary action and dialogue with the president with no recourse to checks and balances in the form of, for example, a robust parliamentary agenda aimed at reconfiguring the political architecture along with active judicial review and mass action and mobilization, then you are simply reinforcing the status quo. Both the PPP and the parliamentary majority treated the historic 2011 election results as normal and engaged as if nothing had changed. The truth is that the results handed the country a scenario that challenged the leaders to think, act, and govern in a new way. Divided government in such circumstances means joint government, and all parties have a constitutional and political duty to ensure that that is enforced. The president had the first call. 
Although the constitution does not bound him to name a national unity government, the constitution does give him the latitude to do so if he chooses. In the case of these results, where it was a tie, the PPP won the executive branch and the other two parties won the legislative branch. In such circumstances, one expected that the president would have done the morally correct thing, and that is name a government of national unity that includes all parties. He did not do that. The onus then was on the opposition parliamentary parties to do so. They themselves did not do so. They did not even bring a motion to the parliament calling for the establishment of such a government. You see, for three years, the leaders of the parliamentary majority led their supporters down the wrong road. And as loyal followers, those supporters tried to make sense out of what was clearly not making sense. From the beginning, some of us felt it was a mistake to allow a minority government to govern as a major majority. Such an approach legitimized a government that by its very definition lacked legitimacy. Legitimacy of a government is conferred not only by the constitution, but more importantly by the belief of the vast majority of the people that the government has the moral and political right to govern. The leaders of the parliamentary majority, against the wishes of their constituencies, gave their stamp of approval to the PPP minority government. They retreated into the role of traditional opposition when the circumstances dictated otherwise. They gave the executive branch unlimited space to govern. They allowed themselves to be bogged down in endless, fruitless dialogue. They stubbornly refused to mobilize their supporters to exercise their constitutional and human right to resist governmental overreach. Their parliamentary behavior, except for the budget cuts and a boycott of the Minister of Home Affairs, lacked the cutting edge and the robustness of an empowered majority. In short, they coddled a government that showed scant respect for the rule of law. They ceded their right to share in the governance of the country. And this is the thanks they got, the suspension of parliament. As Brother Bob Marley observed, hate is your reward for our love. Only recently, I drew attention to the non-strategy behind the no confidence vote. Clearly, our lawyers knew of the president's option to prorogue the parliament. But by not preempting the president, the FC and APNU obviously didn't believe that the PPP would go down that road. In politics, you cannot predict every act of your opponents. But the PPP is an open book when it comes to the politics of domination. Listen carefully to the recent conversation between the attorney general and the journalist, which was exposed by the Kaicho News. And you will hear the extent to which the PPP's praxis is grounded in the notion of racial superiority, the criminalization of the state, and the divine right to govern Guyana. The Attorney General's remarks became the perfect introduction, or one would say segue, to the President's announcement of the suspension of Parliament. Now that Parliament has been suspended, the people's representatives, all of them, have in effect been dismissed by the president. They have no formal forum to represent the, in the interests of their constituencies. They have been put out on the streets, the very streets that for three years they avoided like a plague. The president and his cabinet and the party are the sole rulers of Guyana. They have crowned themselves the dictators of the country. That is what they have always wanted. They have subverted the constitution. They can no longer hold on to the mantle of democracy. It's an illusion. When the door to democratic contestation is slammed in your face, you are left with no other option than to purposely push it open. The president says he subverted the democratic process to prevent obstruction of government and to bring the opposition to the table. What rubbish. The parliamentary opposition parties have been at the table for three years, and the right to obstruct crude and cruel governance is a sacred one. 
Truth be told, the AFC and APNU have not done a quarter of the obstruction they should be doing. In the end, it was the president and his cabinet who end up obstructing the process. The APNU and the AFC have been focusing on elections as the grand solution to the PPP's dictatorship. Such an approach is attractive, but if those elections are conceived outside of a larger political solution, we would be merely reinventing the wheel. In 1992, after the long and sometimes bloody struggle for the removal of the then dictatorial government, democracy was reduced to elections. It was a mistake. We boasted of free and fair elections, but we left the draconian constitution in place and didn't settle the age-old ethnic problem. The end result has been a government that is 10 times worse than the one it replaced. Political rights, political solution, and democracy cannot be confined to elections, important though they are. Much more than that is needed to root out the scourge of dictatorship that has dogged Guyana for all its independence experience. Guyana has had 22 years of PPP's bullying. Bullies do not respond to dialogue strategy. Bullies only respond to dialogue when they know you are prepared to fight back. The PPP will continue to batter Guyana until the leaders, the opposition leaders, show some resolve to wage a relentless struggle to set the crooked way straight and unambiguously declare in word and deed the AUC Guyana dictum. This confounded nonsense must stop. I'm David Hines. Thank you for watching another edition of Hindsight.